Hi, I'm Connor from the Oxbridge Formula. I'm a history and economics student, uh, second year at Regents Park College. And today I'm joined by Holly. Uh, Holly, could you just introduce yourself? What college do you go to and what subject do you do? Yeah, so I'm Holly. I'm a first year. I study history and economics at Regents Park College at Connor. Perfect. I For the take, I did know that uh, Holly's my daughter, uh, college daughter, uh, a system where second and third year students are paired with someone in the year below them just so they're kind of hopefully a friendly face uh, around college helps spread advice of what Oxford's like and in the summer before uh, you come to Oxford you'll get a letter from your college parent just saying hi and who you are um, so I did know that um, I'm just asking for the people uh, for people's benefit at home um, so Holly you do history and economics like myself can you just talk me through the admissions process for history economics? What entrance exams did you have to do? Uh, what was your um, required grades at Oxford? Yeah, so in terms of the admissions process, you obviously do the personal statement at the same time as everyone else. And then you have two tests to take. So there's a history aptitude test for the history part, and then the TSA and um, the thinking skills test, I think, something like that. And you do part one of that, which is like the logical thinking questions and you don't do the second part which is the essay so these are the two tests you do and then if you're lucky with those they'll invite you to interviews where you'll typically have an interview in each and you might get a few more interviews if they're still unsure and then yeah when you get the grades um, I needed three A's so I needed an A I did history maths and further maths I needed an A in all three of those I also did an EPQ but it wasn't conditional on that and then yeah I, I made the grades and I got in that that was my process Perfect. All, all relatively straightforward, um, I hope. Um, how did you find the TSA? How did you prepare for the TSA? Yeah, so the TSA is a hard one because people always say it's something that you can't prepare for. Um, but I would really disagree with this. Uh, the first TSA I did, I actually did in time conditions with my school. We did a practice one um, just to sort of scope out what courses we were interested in. And I actually ended up getting, I think, six points less in that TSA, it's the actual TSA that I did, um, mm -hmm. which is the one that got me an interview and the one that ultimately got me in talks with. So yeah, TSA preparation, what I did was really, I used, I can't remember which one, but I used a workbook, which sort of outlined the questions that you will get. Because I think mm -hmm. there's a misconception that they're just sort of random questions, but there's a very strict format that they follow in the TSA. So there are like logical ones, there are maths ones. And if you can figure out which question they're asking, it makes it so much easier. So they work through a couple methods um, of how to sort of eliminate answers, how to break it down and try and come to a solution. So I worked through those and it was mainly just working through the practice papers and seeing how I could improve. But yeah, definitely I did improve through doing practice. And that's something I think a lot of people don't think you can do with the TSA because it's sort of touted as the one that's just intuitive intelligence. Um, but I definitely saw my grades improve from understanding how the questions actually worked. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you said, because I'd, I'd have to strongly agree that you can definitely improve on the TSA. And I think it is, like you say, it's a bit of a myth and a bit kind of lazy just to go, ah, you, it's innate, you can't uh, improve on it. So uh, we at the Oxbridge Formula, we offer online courses, uh, video solutions, and we've, we've made our own questions actually. So for anyone listening who's uh, about to do the TSA or thinking of the TSA, if you head to the Oxbridge formula or if you have a link in the description below, we've got um, a loads of resources on there. Uh, we've got blogs from current students who have done the TSA, uh, similar to myself and Holly. You can have a look at their stories uh, and please do check out our resources online. Um, but yeah, you said um, you could kind of pick the questions. How did you find the timing issue? That's something that uh, current uh, students say they often struggle with it, especially at the start. How did you find that? Yeah, the timing is such an issue because as I think it was in the first book that I used, it was everyone can get 50 out of 50 in the TSA if they have unlimited time. And that if is, is the crucial thing because it really is about working through questions quickly and not wasting mm -hmm. time. So for me, the thing I struggled with at the start was working through questions and then getting stuck on something and just working through it. And that would waste so much time. So yeah, once I learned the methods of how to do the questions, it sped me up so much quicker. And yeah, the timing is a, is a real issue because ultimately, as I found in the actual TSA, there were questions I knew I could have done, but 
but I just didn't have time to finish them. So yeah, I think the main thing is just recognizing that you won't have time to do every question perfectly, but trying to find mechanisms to do them a bit quicker um, because really time will be the make or break of your TSA score. No, perfect. yeah, exactly the same from my own experience. The first one you do. Um, I don't think I timed myself for the first one and then went, oh, that was, that was quite a high score. I must be doing pretty well. Looked over the clock, like two and a half, <laughs> three hours have gone and I've got to be over. Uh, be quite a kind of lenient examiner, I think, that would let me stay in the exam or uh, an extra hour and a half uh, above and beyond um, the time note. So, yeah, um, I had to realise that I had to change my methods and say any kind of helping or coaching in that aspect of the TSA really does improve um, exam performance. Um, just want to take it back um, a step. Why history economics? What drew you to history and economics as opposed to say either history or something like PPE? Yeah, it's a hard one actually because at the time I didn't really know why history and economics specifically. I actually initially wanted to do a PPE um, but I didn't take uh, politics or philosophy or economics actually at A level. Um, so really it was just about combining the things I did like rather than always wanting to do history and economics. I think there's a big myth about Oxford that people are born and at the age of four they decide they want to study classics or something. It very much wasn't the case for me. I liked history and I knew I definitely wanted to study economics. I was always interested in it and for me it was all, it also gave me the capacity to keep my maths up. So obviously I did maths and further maths. I sort of thought about the idea of a maths degree for a point. I also thought about a history degree at a little bit. And then I realized I sort of stumbled across history and economics and and the cogs sort of twirled in my brain and I realized, oh okay, this is probably the course for me. So yeah, it was it was just about what interested me, what did I think I was good at, rather than picking a course and then picking my A-levels. I just sort of did what felt intuitive. Yeah, sure. No, it wasn't like some kind of beaming light, like you said, kind of four years old that told you, you know, <laughs> economics is the one for you. Much rather, it's a case of actually, I enjoy maths, I enjoy history, let's combine them, and history economics as a result. Uh, yeah, very similar story to mine. You um, say, obviously, A levels, you did further maths and history. You didn't do economics, again, uh, like myself. Uh, what would you say to someone who hasn't studied economics before? going on to do history and economics at Oxford if, if they were thinking of applying how deterred should they be or um, what might someone do to kind of gear themselves up for economics at uni okay so there's there's so much I want to say firstly don't worry about not doing economics I think that was the biggest thing that put me off at first I thought I'd never get an interview because I hadn't studied economics I was worried about my personal statement because I hadn't studied economics. And then when I got to interview, I was concerned, oh, will they recognize that I haven't done it? And will I get different questions? Will I come out looking a lot worse? Because I don't know the theory of capital accumulation mm. or something that someone else would be much better at. But definitely in terms of interviews, they know that. And they don't want someone that knows everything because then when you teach them, you have no way of knowing if they're actually good at learning. So what they're really looking for is logic. And that's why I think the maths helped me because it was about working through problems logically. So for the interview, yeah, don't worry about not studying economics. Don't worry about um, not having as much information behind you because what they're really looking at is a problem solver. Can you work mm. through things intuitively and logically? And if you can, you'll be absolutely fine. Um, and then in terms of the personal statement, yeah, just do what interests you. So for me, that was actually something really sort of left field. I did feminist economics. Um, I did loads of reading on it, yeah, for my EPQ. And I did it about the strengths and weaknesses of economic modeling and maths and economics. Was it good? Did it apply to the female sphere? Did it apply to sort of the female mind in a way? Which I found really interesting. It was kind of niche. I hadn't heard of people doing it before, but I worked it into my personal statement because it was personal. So when I went to interview, I knew absolutely nothing about all these theories of economics that people who had done it at A-level did know. But I had a very clear interest in economics, which I could show. And it was a personal interest rather than just me Googling, like, what do Oxford tutors want me to put in my personal statement? Yeah, so as long as you can show 
a genuine interest in economics, you'll be fine for the personal statement. And as long as you can work through problems logically, you'll be fine for the interview. But just, yeah, don't let it put you off because they don't care if you've done economics or not. They just want to see that you're interested in it and will be a good fit. No, fantastic. I think, like you said, hit the nail on the head that interest is uh, outweighs aptitude, especially um, at kind of interview and per statement level. Um, no, fantastic. So um, just briefly, if um, economics isn't essential at A level, how important would you say maths at A level would be? If someone was thinking about doing history and economics at uni, hadn't got around to choosing the A levels, what would you say about choosing A level maths as a kind of building block? Yeah, I would say if you can, and if you don't think you will do terribly in it, pick maths. Obviously, don't pick maths if you if you're terrible at maths if you're not very good at it i mean even if you aren't maybe economics ba might be more suitable for you mm. or like we consider your options around your aptitudes but yeah maths at a level i cannot emphasize enough how important it is i think mm. oxford asks for as level maths or if you're doing ib then standard level maths but really as much maths as you can afford to do do um, because definitely some of the core economics it builds upon a base of maths that is intuitive if you've done a levels but you have to work a bit harder if you've only done as so for me doing further maths i felt like it was a real advantage because we were learning things about sort of partial derivatives which i've come across already and which i was very fluent with um, even if you know even if the mechanics that i had learned in a level wasn't directly applicable it was about being really quick and being really efficient and understanding what was going on. So yeah, as much maths as you can do, do it is all I can say. You see, so you kind of talked about the kind of like quality of maths that um, economics that you have to do um, partial derivatives, which is kind of a form of multivariate calculus, which is a, uh, A2 or kind of a latter stage, uh, AS uh, first year. For maths, how much would you say the kind of quantity of maths and economics is? How much of your time is spent doing maths as opposed to kind of economic theory? Would you say? Um, yeah. hmm. It's hard to say because there's actually not that much maths in economics in terms of content. You're pretty much always doing the same kind of thing. It's usually a lot of calculus. It's a lot of pure maths, which you then apply to economics. So the actual hmm. math, there isn't that much theory to know, but you use maths quite a lot because economics you know in in microeconomics it's about optimization it's about profit maximizing for a firm or utility maximizing for an individual and all of this brings in calculus so in terms of breadth of maths there isn't that much because you just have to really be quite good at a very small amount of calculus um, but yeah maths itself comes up all the time in economics which is why i think it's really important to be as fluent as you can because if, if you're just two, three seconds quicker, it makes you so much more efficient and you, you can understand things a lot more intuitively, um, which I've certainly found in lectures. They have a lot of maths up in the lectures. They'll sometimes work through examples. And if you can work through it alongside, if you're sort of listening to the lecture and working through it on your own, then it sort of makes sense. Whereas if you're lagging behind because you don't understand the maths, then sort of the lecture can perhaps fall apart and you have to go back to things. So yeah use a lot of maths, I use maths a lot, but the actual specifics of the maths, it's mainly just calculus. Mm. No, okay, yeah, being kind of mathematically literate is, is kind of, you would say, is the important thing. Perfect, um, excellent. Um, so yeah, just to say, I guess, kind of, um, what would you say like a standard worksheet looks like in economics? Because uh, from my own perspective, uh, when I do it, a lot of it, I was surprised by how much maths there was on it as in you might have 10 questions say on a worksheet and a good kind of eight of them or at least kind of four fifths of a part of the question would be kind of mathematically what show or answer or show how you might do something what was would your experience differ much from that or what would you kind of add yeah there's definitely so there is a mix of maths and sort of essay questions but there's certainly a real emphasis on the maths in the problem sheets and in the exam, so in a typical tutorial sheet, it might have like six quite long questions with an A, B, C, D, E, F, and then A will be very basic maths, and B might add something new, add a new variable, a new thing to consider, and you have to work through it. So yeah, 
a lot of the time these sort of longer mathematical questions you end up with results so you'll end up with a value or some kind of equation and then even in terms of the essays when you write essays they bring in maths which i think was really strange for me um coming from having only done history um i didn't do economics at a level so i didn't know what economics essays were like but now i'm writing them and i've got a graph halfway through my essay and i'm working through maths so even in the essays maths is everywhere you can't really escape it and it's not something you want to escape sort of as much maths as you can put it into your economics understand economics through the maths and it will become a lot clearer hmm. i like yeah it is true you're kind of in a historian when you go to draw the graph it's like oh no this is this isn't right stop <laughs> stop when you you're kind of even from like gcse level well, before gcse level you're kind of a level your history teacher would be like you can't have head you can't have subheadings you can't have anything else Economists are having like, oh, have diagram, have a little kind of flow diagram, have a flow chart. Yeah, kind of the competing minds of a history and economics student is. <laughs> um, perfect. So we'll move forward slightly. Um, we mentioned um, interviews. What was your interview process like? How many interviews did you have and um, where did you have them? Yeah, so I was really, well, lucky in a way, lucky for some people, perhaps unlucky for others, but I only had the two allotted interviews. So I actually, I applied to Pembroke College for history and economics thinking, great, love the college, it's quite small, it's quite central. And then I actually got reallocated to Regents before interview. Uh, luckily mm. Regents is very similar to Pembroke, also quite small, also quite central, um, also really good history um, tutors and economics tutors. So yeah, that was very lucky for me, but I only had two interviews. So I had one for history and one for economics. My history one, I think we had a pre-reading. So we got sent down to a library and we had 15 minutes to read through this four page source or something like that. And then we came up and two history tutors had an interview. They worked through some questions about who, who, who it was by and what the themes were and what I thought of it. So that was a history interview. And then the economics interview was just sort of, it was much like a tutorial actually, the economics one. So my tutor, he worked through questions. He, he sort of asked me one main question. I'd settle on an answer and then he'd throw in new information. I'd have to respond to it. And then he'd sort of give me a, a pad and some paper and a pen. And he'd be like, okay, draw this on a diagram. So the economics interview was, it was very much about responding to new information and thinking about things from an economics point of view. But yeah, there was no economics content that I needed for that. And that was on, yeah, so the Thursday and the Wednesday were my interviews. And then the Friday, they can ask people back if they're not sure or if they want to reallocate, but they just sort of sent me home. They made their decisions for history and economics. And then I had a nice day out in Oxford and went home. Okay, fantastic. Well, um, focus, I think, first on the kind of economics interview it's, itself. Can you remember what the topic was for the economics interview or kind of any questions? Or you said about diagrams. Do you remember the diagram you had to draw? uh yeah i think it was i think it was something to do with growth um and okay. development the interview theme in general because as i said they have to select interview questions that they can ask someone who has and who hasn't done economics and i was actually very good friends with the other girl interviewing for economics at regents and once we both finished we sort of compared and we had the same questions so they very much do they, they sort it in a way that anyone can answer them, whether they've done economics or not. But yeah, it was about growth. It was about how a country might grow, how its healthcare system may work. Is it good if everyone is equal? And I, and I sort of said, yeah, e equality is great. We want everyone to be equal. We want to share out the wealth. And then Joel said, well, what if everyone's equally poor? And then I had to reconsider that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think it was a logarithmic graph. So it, that's what I'm talking about when I say new information we were really considering a developing nation how it might grow what we might do to help it grow what might the obstacles be and whether we want equality or whether we'd like a little bit less equality but everyone's less equal but more prosperous so yeah the sort of economics questions that you don't need to know anything about economics to do um but you can sort of have a stab at okay no fantastic that's that's really useful information um is was there anything that you kind of read which you thought you could put in as in there's sometimes it's advised you buy subscriptions to like the economist or something useful like that or i think the faculty recommends like a, 
a few Paul Krugman books, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist. Uh, had you read anything kind of wider around to help you with interviews or not really because you're kind of just uh, kind of lay person's interest in economics, which kind of got you through? Yeah, I mean, I was quite busy when interviews were going on because I had my coursework and because I was sort of trying to write my personal statement and then everything, all of my A-levels were sort of wrapping up, ready for revision. So I definitely didn't read as much as I thought I should have before the interview. But when it got into the interview, it became a bit clearer that it's really not about knowing everything. So I would definitely say, yeah, The Economist is good. Financial Times, if you can. Don't try and read things which are very clearly suited for people who've done a PhD in economics because they're not looking for you to sort of regurgitate someone's theory that you clearly don't understand. But if there are things that interest you and that give you a broad understanding, then read them. I think I, I read one of Krugman's, I can't remember now which one it was. Um, I also read or reread some of the books from my EPQ, which were about homo economicus and mathematical mm. modeling. Some of the more intrinsic questions to economics, mm. some of the ones that are really fundamental to how we go about practicing economics. Um, but I definitely recommend The Economist and just things in the news because they give you a really short snapshot or even podcasts, just small things that can build some kind of base level of knowledge in economics rather than trying to read some great long treaties like the wealth of nations. It mm. might be good for you, but it's certainly not an efficient way to deal with it. Read what interests you um, and read what gives you sort of a basic grounding in economics. No, perfect. Yeah, the idea that you can kind of just um, read around dotted interests, whatever kind of interests you, go on Spotify, find podcasts which interest you, find news stories which interest you. Yeah, and that uh, obviously your experience shows that, like you say, you don't have to be an expert in econ economics before going to an economics interview. That would kind of ruin the whole point if you uh, already knew the entirety of the course you're applying to, to learn. Um, but yeah, that your kind of own curiosity can carry you uh, through e economics interview. Um, perfect, just moving on uh, slightly, you said at kind of the end uh, of the interview, uh, process you managed to get a like a kind of day to wander around Oxford. Uh, did you enjoy your interview process, or would you say that's kind of too too strong a, a word? How would you mm -hmm. kind of describe it? I yeah, I think looking back, I love the interview process. It was really exciting to be going to Oxford because I'd I think I'd been there twice on open days, but I'd sort of gone down, looked at every college I possibly could and gone back up, whereas the interview process was a very long experience, which I think differs to Cambridge as well. At Oxford, you have usually like three days, and you might have, in my case, I had 40 minutes of interviews in a three-day period. So I got to go around Oxford, I got to see Waterstones, I went down, I had some food with some of the other girls who were interviewing. We set up a group chat full of loads of people. Who I'm actually now, I'm living with people that I met um, next year I'm living with people that I met at interview which I just think is really cool because we sort of built those friendships and now some of them are, are at different universities some of them at Durham some are in America so yeah the interview process was really relaxing in a strange way other than the short 20 minutes of interviews which weren't horrible either there was so much to do and it was just a really good opportunity um, although if I could do it again I would have probably stayed in my room a bit less I saw the first day I was in there like reading and thinking I could prepare my way out of failure that I thought was coming. Um, but then definitely by the second and third day, I got to explore Oxford and it was a really nice experience. And, you know, if you get an offer, then it's brilliant because you know the city a bit better. And if you don't, then you've had three days to explore a really nice, a really lovely city and meet lots of new people. Um, and the interviews themselves aren't horrible either. Tutors aren't looking to catch you out. They're not waiting for you to make mistakes. So they can go, ha, you can't get in. You know, they really want to see you do well and they want to push you to do well. Um, so yeah, it was a really, really positive experience and definitely not something that I should have been afraid of. No, perfect. That's, um, yeah, really good, really good answer. My, um, um, I applied to Jesus College and then uh, got pulled to Regents on the third day. I remember like the first thing I read from Jesus was they gave us like a sheet from like the, the JCR prayers and at the bottom it said like, although it's going to be stressful, try to enjoy yourself. And I just remember reading that and thinking, 
like, yeah, right. <laughs> like, sorry, no one enjoys themselves in interviews. It's going to be horrible. And like you said, kind of stays your room, a bit anxious. Um, by the third day, I was in Hartford JCR um, at like half 10 playing with my friends on like a video console. Uh, and then kind of stayed out so late. Uh, I got locked out of Jesus College and I had to wait for someone to, to come in. I forgot to read the kind of like um, door shut at half 10. Uh, and here's the number if uh, you do get locked out. I'd forgotten both the time it shut and the number. So uh, I don't know if you've got any kind of other similar stories from interview. I'm hoping not kind of so perilous, mm. but. I, I have one funny, kind of funny, I, I look back and I'm embarrassed now story. So pretty much everyone that has an interview, I find, has got some kind of a horror story, which at the time they think is just the worst thing that's ever happened. And then you get here and you realize that everyone else has sort of done the same thing or, or had a, an equally silly moment. But for me, probably the funniest thing is, uh, yeah, the other history and economics girl who's interviewing on... I think it was the first night we were a bit scared to go too far in case for some reason at 8 p.m. they called us for interview. Not that that would happen. We were so scared to go out. So we decided the furthest we could go for dinner was McDonald's. <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't know Oxford, it's about a, a five minute walk from Regents at a push. And I didn't know Oxford at the time, really. I didn't know how far away it was. But when we walked there, we thought we were out of the city. We thought we were so far away. We were panicking that they were going to call us to interview. And I, it only took when I sort of came here as a fresher and realised how ridiculous that was for me to understand <laughs> that I was panicking far too much, that they were going to call me for interview and I'd be so far away from Regents when in reality... I was at McDonald's, <laughs> sort of a four minute walk away. Um, but it's those kind of stories which you laugh about later because uh, definitely there, there's good memories attached to them, uh, especially being there now. I think back to my interviews, which were lovely because it was Christmas time and every, everyone was excited. They were nervous, but they were excited to make friends. So yeah, I look back on these memories fondly, but I do think I was, I was stressing a little bit too much about them calling me for interview at 8 p.m., but I laugh about it now. I remember the exact same thing. They didn't actually ever say when they were going to update the boards. They just said, well, update the boards throughout the day, which is like, well, the day is 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., like you say. So when do you update them? Uh, so, yeah, I, I remember similar. I, I must check the kind of the Jesus, uh, like, notification board about, like, 10, 15 times a day. Like you say, even though it's kind of getting to 7 p.m. I'm sure they wouldn't now, probably, but I'm not sure. Um, perfect. So um, we we'll talked about kind of, pre-Oxford uh, admissions and interview. Uh, I'm going to put this question up. Uh, what does a typical typical day look like for you? Which is, uh, as an Oxford student, it's always kind of like a, a bit of a pain because every day is kind of slightly different. Um, if, if you could, kind of what does like a working day look like, first of mm -hmm. all? Okay, I'll take my typical Monday because mm -hmm. I always have, well, in Hillary and in Michaelmas, which are the first two terms, I just reverse them, but they're the first two terms, uh, of the year. Uh, I have uh, economics lectures Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in first year. So my typical Monday, I wake up fairly early. I wake up at like six. Um, oh. Don't know why. I know. I just, and when I'm at home, I, I wake up so late, it's embarrassing. But at uni, I wake up really early at six. I usually have a shower, get ready for the day. I might pop down to Tesco's or the co-op for my food. Um, it's like a three minute walk from Regents, which is lovely. There are so many supermarkets in Oxford. It's very strange to get used to, but it's very handy at the same time. And then I'll maybe do a little bit of reading. Um, I usually have one essay and one problem sheet a week. So I'll have something on the go. It's I, I, either an essay, usually an essay actually on the Monday, Monday in the morning. Sometimes I do that in the Regents library because as I wake up a lot earlier than most students after a weekend, it's quite quiet and so I can just relax as the sun's coming in, which is lovely. And then I have a lecture at 11 a.m. So I'll walk down there to exam schools, which is a really lovely walk. And uh, I'll go to my lecture, never miss one, which is good for me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then I walk back with my friend from St. Peter's College, who I actually met in my very first lecture. We've been walking back from lectures ever since, which is really sweet. Um, I might have some lunch work through the lecture, which I find is really important, especially if there are bits I don't understand, I'll go through it again, go through my notes and go through the slides and be like, and sort of iron out any details. 
maybe do a little bit more work, have some dinner with my friends. And then there's often some kind of a social event on. So whether this is for a society, sometimes we go out clubbing. I don't do that particularly, but there's also pubs. Um, my course goes out on sort of course meetups every term, every few every few weeks we'll go out to the local weather spoons and yeah so my evenings tend to be not working <laughs> i think it's such a big myth about oxford that you're sort of working constantly you work until your work is done and then you can relax and mm. it's not like you're given so much work that you can't breathe um the, the tutors actually in my first my first meeting with my director of studies he was like please don't work too much you're here at university for an experience. Part of that experience will be academic, but part of it will be meeting people, developing your ideas, you know, going to societies, picking up sports. So yeah, the evenings for me tend to be pretty free. I'll have some food with my friends. If I've still got an essay, I might go to the library for a bit, but typically I didn't work much. Yeah, I, I work probably a lot less than I did at A-levels, which uh, is very nice if you're an A-level student hearing that right now. <laughs> No, okay, fantastic. Just to kind of uh, specify a bit more, is there any activities or societies you take part in uh, regularly or what, what do you kind of spend your free time doing? Yeah, so I sort of pick things up really randomly. I signed myself up to everything, everything I could see in Freshers' Week, which I think was a great idea because I know what all the societies are now, although I probably ignore most of their emails um, through about meeting <laughs> yeah so i i do a lot of stuff actually for like charity and access so i'm a pfo which is a publicity um volunteer for oxford nightline which is like a listening service it's run by and for students at oxford and oxford brook so i do a lot of work with them just organizing their publicity getting the word out which i really enjoy um i also do stuff for that oxford girl which um if you've heard of it yeah she she runs a blog about access and we write things for that um, what else do I do? I do lots of little bits here and there, or I'll go to a an event. They, there are often speakers in. If you're part of the union, they'll have a speaker in every now and again that interests you. So it's much it's much less fixed than that, but we'll sometimes go out and see a show or things like that. So yeah, I'm in lots of societies, but it's not it's very much not the case that everyone fixes themselves to going to every event, and it's more if you have time for it go if it interests you go but you're not really everything is free for you to do no fantastic i, I, I have to kind of uh, kind of agree with my own experience that actually uh sometimes you hear kind of students ex experiences and they sound very much like oh i uh i don't have much free time but when i do i'm kind of prayers of this society i'm doing this as well <laughs> kind of really like full in kind of similar to you that actually you have a fair bit of free time but you get to kind of pick and choose who you spend that with and that kind of you can kind of float around a little bit that even kind of just kind of small quality free time just mucking about in the, the junior common room with friends or cooking something uh together which obviously goes kind of horribly wrong uh with people or kind of various other kind of bits and bobs uh just you're around friends all the time really so um yeah like you say you can kind of you can float around at oxford and just kind of do what appeals to you um I'm just going to take it back um, right to the start of your Oxford experience. Um, what advice would you give to an Oxbridge fresher in terms of how did you find Freshers' Week, first of all? Yeah, so my Freshers' Week was, it was a really good one, actually. Um, I was, I had a, a like a mini exam on the Friday of Freshers' Week, uh, which was just like, it was just like really basic maths. Can you add two and two together just to make sure um, that you could do things? And it got a little bit harder as the exam went on just to sort of see where we were with the maths. And, you know, if we needed extra help, then we could get it, which I actually, in hindsight, really appreciate. Um, but my Freshers' Week was mainly just meeting as many people as I could. We went out to bars a lot. They ran sort of club nights for the Freshers. There was a lot going on um, and every society was running things that were freshest fairs, there were freshest stalls. There was so much going on that I didn't expect. I kind of thought I'd come to Oxford and everyone would sit in their bedrooms and work all day, every day. And it could not be further, could not be further from the truth. So yeah, I did a little bit of work for my exam 
because I didn't want to fail it. Um, but luckily, I didn't. And yeah, I, I had a lot of fun. We went out to so many bars. We sort of met the other people in our group. We, I think we had a, a, a dinner with our college families. There were like eight of us. We went out to Pizza Express or somewhere like that with the college families, which was lovely. And then we went to Oxford's famous G&D's ice cream shop uh, afterwards, which was a really nice experience. So yeah, we did lots of stuff in Freshers Week. Um, and if anyone's coming, if you do have some kind of an exam, don't miss out on your Freshers Week for it. Perfect. Well, I'm, I'm glad you had a good time. I was on uh, Freshers Committee uh, and your college dad. So uh, <laughs> both, both boxes ticked. I'm glad you enjoyed uh, <laughs> things. Um, you mentioned uh, bars and pubs, etc, uh, etc. Et For someone who doesn't drink, uh, how, how would you have found Freshers Week? Because uh, I'm pretty sure that you don't drink or don't kind of drink massively. So how did Oxford compare? Or how did your Freshers Week compare to kind of what you might see as a typical uh, Freshers Week, which involves, um, well, kind of alcohol, uh, late nights out, and maybe kind of great food. But how would you kind of compare that, like, expectation versus kind of reality? Yeah, so I don't drink at all, not even a sip. So yeah, the Oxford Freshers Week, I think everyone was expecting me from home to somehow move to alcohol because there's no way you can do Freshers Week without drinking, but there was definitely not the case for me. I went to the bars with my friends who drink. Some of them drink, a couple of them are like me, don't drink, a couple of them don't drink too much. Went to the bars, I had a few, I think I had like a water and a virgin drink, something something along those lines. Um, and then we went out to another bar the night after that, did the same thing, didn't have alcohol. I've been clubbing since, I didn't go clubbing in Freshers Week um, because I think I was just really tired um from, from all the bars um but I, i've been clubbing since i still haven't drunk so yeah the Oxford experience that i found is something i've never felt like i need to drink for i mean even going to clubs even going to bars i've never felt in any way like i should drink and people are very respectful actually of other people's choices there are people who drink a lot there are people who go out a lot there are people who go out a lot and don't drink at all there are people who drink a lot and don't go out you know everyone's very free to do what they want and I felt like my freshers was no different to anyone else's and I didn't feel a pressure to drink um yeah at all awesome fantastic there's a myth kind of both ways that Oxford people aren't um Oxford D enough that you kind of everyone's working all the time like robots but at the same time it's not studenty enough that everyone is then kind of uh 24 7 uh, alcoholics there is kind of a happy middle ground where people uh, like yourself you can kind of go out without drinking or there's uh kind of various you can do work if you want but you don't have to um work yourself to death um can you kind of give an example of uh, something in freshers week um that was like a non-alcoholic event or what kind of what was your favorite event about freshers week favorite or, event. Um, it's really hard to remember now actually all the things we did hmm. um I'm gonna say, and this is not just because you're my college father, but I'm gonna say the college family meal. So we went for a really nice pizza out with uh, our family, which is just you, me and Mona. Um, and then I think five or so other people from another sort of extended family. And yeah, we had pizza. There was, I think there was probably wine served, none of it to me. Um, and we had a really lovely few hours um, just in Oxford meeting the other students. Um, which was really nice, I think, because at school you very much get conditioned to speak to people in your year and befriend people in your year. And then instantly in Oxford, there was an event put on where there was like no pressure to drink. It was just about eating some nice pizza with people from an older year group who were genuinely invested in you having a good time and who genuinely wanted to, you know, build a friendship with you and make your college as friendly of a place as you could. Um, there were loads of other non-drinking events. I think there was like a pizza night uh, or a mm. game night or a film night, something like that. And then throughout the day, there were loads of activities on to like get to know other freshers. So the, the freshers reps ran loads of things with like drawing the executive JCR officers, which was really funny. So yeah, lots of the things in the daytime don't involve drinking. And what I found in my freshers week, although I can't name them, there would typically be like a drinking thing and then a non-drinking thing. So you had the option to like go out to the club. I mean, you didn't have to drink if you didn't want to, but 
lots of people would drink. And then at the same time, there would be a non-drinking event, um, which I found was really good um, for people like me, because there was an option to be surrounded by people not drinking, as well as the option to go and not drink personally. Yeah, two different options. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I, I just kind of uh, going to the kind of question at the bottom of the screen, what advice would you give to an Oxford professional? We, we've said that um, you can kind of enjoy yourself regardless, you know, there's no pressure to do whatever. And possibly the kind of advice I would give is uh, Freshers' Week, like you said, even if you've got something at the end of the week, is is a, like a time to enjoy yourself and actually if you kind of bring in any stress um, or kind of anxiety. Uh, that might kind of hinder your enjoyment. But it's that obviously, it's university's new, Oxford's new, so it's, you can't eliminate all of it, but you want to kind of come into the new term as, as stress free as you can and not work yourself uh, relentlessly over the summer. And say, when you get to the freshers week, enjoy yourself in the ways that you want to or would feel inclined to. So if that is like an early, early night or kind of a few uh, kind of nights in, kind of just chatting to people around the JCR. Um, what advice would you give to an Oxford fresher, a, a kind of apart from the cliche, uh, be yourself? Is there anything uh, specific or kind of just general that you would say? Um, don't put too much pressure, freshers pressure on you. Like freshers week is so often called like the best week of your life after your exams are over, your big long summer, you just go all out. You're going to meet your best friends ever you're going to have the best week ever, you're going to go clubbing every night, you're not going to get ill, and if you do get ill, then Freshers Flu will hit you at the end of the week magically after you've had the world's greatest week. Um, mm. so I think that is, I mean, it's great and it's true for some people, but there's definitely a real importance of not putting pressure on your Freshers Week because, you know, it is, it is a week. It's a week where you don't have any work, albeit, but it's a week and, you know, other weeks will come. You might have more fun. You might meet your friends in Freshers Week. Much more likely that your closest friends by the end of your degree will not be people that you've met in Freshers Week. So, you know, it's okay if you get homesick. It's okay if, you know, you don't feel up to a night out. This FOMO needs to be thrown out of the window because Freshers Week might be amazing, but it's definitely not something to fret about, about making sure that it's perfect. Because I know, at least for me, I had a great Freshers Week, but I also had a great week one and then a great week two and then a really great week eight you know it wasn't like I was stuck to the idea of my freshers week being perfect and I think that's that's what made me enjoy it was just the idea that you know I might have a a terrible boring meeting about fire safety to get through but you know that on the whole it didn't matter as long as I was just sort of relaxed and taking what is quite a stressful experience sort of moving to university if you haven't left home much before taking it all in, you know, not putting too much pressure on myself. Perfect, yeah, the idea that kind of Freshers Week is some kind of golden age that uh, you'll never ever, um, <laughs> ever ever have again is uh, something to kind of a myth to dispel. That's, yeah, really important. I'd, I'd have to agree with you that uh, it was my birthday, the first day we kind of moved in Freshers Week, so I got given like a Colin the Caterpillar cake, uh, which then kind of sat on my shelf for like kind of two days. I wasn't really kind of confident enough to kind of say for strangers are. Like, oh, Come and come around and have cake, but then like, once you get to kind of just know people, just bumping around to them like around college, that so I think we kind of just had like chats on like the staircase, like kind of five, six, seven of us, not going to the, not even going to like, the kind of the, uh, common room to kind of sit on the sofa, just just kind of bumping into people. That yeah, like you say, like it, that doesn't have, that's not a thing that only happens in first week. It's you kind of bump into more and more people that you naturally socialise. That yeah, you don't have to put any pressure on yourself to make. Uh, all your friends in this uh, allotted time window that it can just kind of be like a natural uh, kind of crystallization. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a really important uh, lesson. Um, fantastic. So um, we, you said um, that uh, another really important thing that um, you think the family dinner, which is something that I really enjoyed as well. My only one when I was a fresher, we went around to someone's house and we had uh, fajitas, I think. Uh, but that was quite nice to just kind of chat about <laughs> Yeah, I know they did a really, a really nice job. We're gonna. Uh, it was kind of reported that oh, we're gonna cook for you guys. You're thinking, uh oh, like oh no, <laughs> I'd rather. Not. But uh, no, it was, it was really nice, and it's um, nice. You kind of, like you say, kind of meet second and third years older people that you might feel kind of slightly intimidated of, uh, just because a they're bigger and b older and c wiser. Um, but it kind of breaks down those barriers for you. Um, I was just gonna wonder, did you think that? Um, 
what was uh, Regent like going into? What, how would you uh, did kind of what was it like first main for the Regent JCR the, the, the junior common one? Sorry, could you repeat that? My um sound cut out. Um, what would you say it was like uh, coming into the Regent's JCR? What did they kind of do to put you at ease, or what what's Regent's like as a ethos? Oh, Regents is amazing. I know I'm biased and every everyone you meet says that their college is the best college. People get really, really passionate about their college. But Regents is so friendly. Um, it just does so much to make the JCR specifically a home for everyone. And I think that's really key because your JCR sort of as your student body congregates in this room, which has loads of really comfortable leather sofas three coffee tables which have always got biscuits in a table is it table football um and a ping pong table it's just sort of like perfectly designed for random people to come in and you know they might just be sitting down on the sofa some third year that you've never spoken to before and you you walk in it's just them in there and you'll end up having a conversation about really random stuff you know you might have a biscuit or two might make yourself a, a cup of tea or a cup of coffee maybe even play ping pong if someone else comes in. It's just a really friendly space because everyone sort of knows that when you're there, it's about relaxing and being calm and being friendly to other people. Um, and one thing that Regent starts to do, which I really love is uh, brew. So two times a day, uh, the, Je the Regent's JCR secretary, she puts out biscuits, like three packs of biscuits um, at 10 and at four every day. And then we have like special brews at the weekend. We have like Uber brew. Um, brunch brew which is a personal favorite of mine and it just means that random people come to the jcr they want the free biscuits and they end up leaving like two hours later after having a conversation with you and i've met so many second and third years that i've like built friendships with over biscuits that i wouldn't necessarily have like interacted with maybe they live out and they i don't know study geography and they row which i don't do but we sort of bond over these biscuits so yeah, Regents being such a small college and having this brew system in place just means you meet other people from other years and like with other interests, with other personalities to you. And it's very much a relaxed thing. You can just meet them, chat to them and build really nice bonds, really nice friendships with people that you wouldn't expect to otherwise. Toasty, I remember, uh, it feels like ages ago, this is uh, being filmed in kind of June, 2020. So um, Corona is uh, still, still amongst us. Uh, but a uh, kind of couple of terms ago that it'd often be kind of uh, me and you would kind of bump each other at these kind of the, the brews that say it's, uh, Regents is a small college. We have about 30 undergrads come in um, each year. So the intake's very small, but like you put really eloquently that the Regents puts a lot of effort into ensuring its JCRs are really kind of close knit and inclusive space and kind of social boundaries are really kind of broken down very early on that people are just going to mill about there and it's 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 really nice you can pretty much guarantee that someone is uh, not working in there when they probably should be working but they're not working uh, and you can have like you say have a conversation with someone random about a probably quite random subject uh, <laughs> um fantastic um just kind of carrying on about regions slightly what uh what would you say like the accommodation is like what can you just describe your room very briefly yeah, so Regents, we have accommodation first year and third year, and then we typically live out second year. So I'm living out um, out sort of Cowley Way with a few friends next year. But this year I've been living in the main block, which is about 10 metres from the JCR. Great for me for biscuit time. And my room was absolutely massive. It was incredible. So it looks out onto the quad. Regents has like one quad. And both sides sort of, of the length ways are filled with first year accommodation. So I lived in that room for first year. It's got, you know, a really nice like built in kind of storage cabinet thing above a fireplace, which I loved. I put my folders up there. I had a little potted fake plant. I had a cactus. It was very aesthetic. I had my fairy lights. Um, yeah, loads of space, even for a rug. The room is really big um, right next to the JCR and about two rooms across from the kitchen. So at Regents, which they don't, have at every college. I very, very much um, in terms of kitchen access, but we had a kitchen in first year, which was like a galley kitchen, but it had everything that you could want for us to cook. Uh, and a lot of socialization actually happens in the kitchen. 
Um, so yeah, my first year accommodation, big room, single bed, looking out onto trees and a really beautiful quad and very close to a kitchen. So yeah, no complaints about accommodation. It's really, really lovely at Regents. No, thanks. A, a very nice picture there. You are were obviously in Maine, I think. There's like three different accommodation blocks. Uh, Maine is probably the kind of winner. Um, I was in Boulding, which is possibly kind of second club. <laughs> Holly grimaces that for those listening. To, or, Boulding um, bunker. <laughs> Boulding bunker is true. The lights uh, on the kind of corridor aren't uh, automatically lit, lit up, so when you have to kind of step in, the lights that come on. But the kind of two seconds when you can open the door and there's no lights, it does uh, when the kind of fire, um, I don't know, like fire door lights are on, it does look like some kind of nuclear submarine. But uh, very nice rooms, kind of very similar to your own, the same kind of amenities. Um, is there anything you'd recommend people uh, bring to university with them? Uh, you said about rugs. I remember from my own room, I didn't bring any posters the first term, which was um, like a one-stop uh, kind of tip to get uh, make your room feel like a, some kind of prison, um, which I would definitely recommend putting something on the wall, regardless of how kind of hideous it is, uh, just to avoid kind of blank walls. Is there anything you would recommend or you found really useful? Yeah, I mean, mine was definitely the decorative uh, throws. I had about four by the end of Hillary term, um, by the time I came home uh, for online Trinity term. Uh, yeah, because but I think at all accommodations in Regents, the rooms are massive and mm -hmm. you'll have like a bed, but you might also have two or three random chairs or just for people to sit in. So I had two chairs. And I put a massive throw over them and turned them into a sofa for the unknowing eye, which I really appreciated. And then I had an, I had a rug on the floor. And the girl in the room next to me, uh, she actually put up, I think it was like wallpaper, kind of paper or card with, um, oh. so I didn't describe it very well, but there's like a, the inbuilt, um, like uh, some kind of like system of, Adhesiveness. With the, uh, uh, you put things on it. Um, what, like shelf or a shelf, frame? Yeah, it was like an inbuilt <laughs> shelf system, and she put cards behind it to turn it all pink and purple, which was really nice. Um, so yeah, and uh, photos as well. Just anything you can to sort of spice up the space because when you move in, it's like a night, like a fairly bland cream on the walls and a fairly bland carpet and you know some wooden furniture but if you add just a few little touches obviously don't don't spend a load of money because it's just not worth it but if you have things just take them in the car if you can and put them up and it'll just make it feel like home which can especially help if you're feeling a little bit homesick at the start fantastic yeah perfect uh, that was that would have been good advice for me so i remember kind of when you're feeling kind of slightly down the first two weeks you look around your room uh, and you see kind of absolutely nothing comforting at all <laughs> <laughs> watching up you need to do that like, oh oh dear <laughs> doesn't get um yeah no uh decorations uh your sofa idea sounds like a really nice one actually i'm, I'm a bit jealous of that and, and region's really good at um having kind of random chairs in in rooms just so you can have socialize with friends that's like a really nice touch um you mentioned uh the kitchens did you often cook for yourself or did you eat in hall uh, regions provides food uh, Monday to Friday, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but no uh, weekend food. What did? Um, how did you uh, sustain yourself for most of? Yeah, the I mean, it, it varied by week. Uh, I typically go for a Tesco meal deal on the way back from my lectures when I could. Can't go wrong <laughs> with a Tesco meal deal. Um, and I'd have breakfast on my own. But in terms of like dinners, half the, pro pro probably about most of the time, I would have food from the kitchen. So I cook my own food. Uh, a lot of the time, I do that with friends so when you have when you go to tesco's we'd go at like 8 p.m 9 p.m and get all the cheap food um and then we cook it up and you know you tend to get things and meals for three so you know you'll get two chicken breasts in one go and enough vegetables for a small family so if you cook them all together we'd often sort of end up three of us sitting on my bedroom floor having this meal and we'd alternate between who was cooking which was really nice and then on Fridays, I'd typically go to formal if I could, if I wasn't too busy. Um, so that's like a three course meal that you prepay for. Uh, you, there's like a system online and I do that. So yeah, it varied. It really is about convenience, which is 
very handy for regents because not, none of the formals are compulsory and none of the meals are compulsory. So you, it's a pay as you go kind of system. It gets added onto your bill at the end. So you can have as much or as little as you want. Um, and for me, I just sort of take every day um, depending on what I needed. Perfect. You've painted a, a, a really lovely picture there. I remember doing uh, something kind of very similar actually with my uh, two of my uh, friends in um, first year. A trip to Tesco, the reduced section. If you can, you kind of slowly become like a wily old fox as you kind of kind of can pick the time for the reduced section is most stacked. Um, there's that. That's a real kind of cult. The other kind of cult you have in Tesco is the cult of the Tescalator. It's got its own <laughs> Facebook page. Um, which kind of it gives access to the uh, second floor, which breaks uh, now and then, um, and everyone is thrown into disarray. Um, have we got any kind of stories from uh, cooking experiences? I remember a big cooking disaster was we tried to make KFC, um, so you kind of get lots of oil, um, put it in a big pot, put your chicken in, and then kind of throw all your spices in. Uh, we did that, and... Uh, we followed the recipe, uh, put in for about 15 minutes, took it out, uh, got cut into it, and it was kind of completely and utterly raw. Uh, we realized we'd followed the complete wrong instructions for like chicken nuggets as opposed to whole chicken legs. So it was pretty much like bleeding. Uh, have you got any <laughs> uh, cooking stories or anything kind of notably going wrong? Or, or alternatively, have you, did you impress yourself? What, did, what was your kind of most impressive meal you made? Mm, honestly, I, I mean, I don't know whether to be proud or, or not of this, but we didn't really have any disasters. Um, we did a lot of fun things with the kitchens, that, and then they were a real hub for socialization. I remember in North Week, right before term started, I came back a bit early, um, and there was another guy, um, one of my friends. We ended up, I ended up cooking him a stir fry, and he had loads of really random things that he wanted to get rid of. So it's like this stir fry with rice and like three bits of pasta and some fake corn and like two carrots, which I cut into hearts for him and some broccoli. It was just the, the strangest mix. And then we added like, I think it was um, stir fry mix or fajita mix, something something like that. This did not work with the pasta. Um, but, you know, we had it. It was a really nice event. And then, yeah, so one of my friends is really into baking. And every time another one of my friends, um, his her boyfriend would come to stay. So every time he would come to stay every weekend, we'd have a different cake. So we had a couple of pineapple upside down cakes. We had a Victoria sponge. We had a chocolate cake. We had everything. And it would become this, sort of this thing every weekend. We'd have some new cake that was baked in the kitchen by my friend. And then there would be about 10 of us in one of the bedrooms very comfortably. If you want like an understanding of the size of these bedrooms, there would be 10 of us sitting very comfortably having this cake um, as like a celebration uh, of the fact that the week was over and the boyfriend had come and we were all having this lovely cake. So yeah, it was it was a really nice thing, um, but no, no disasters, I don't think. No, okay, well, advice there is A, uh, make friends uh, with people who can cook and B, make friends with um, people who have significant others who celebrate by making entire cakes. No, uh, really important advice there. <laughs> um, so I guess we've spoken quite a bit about regions. Is there anything else do you think kind of separates regions or anything else that you really treasure about regions? I know you were really unfortunate in the sense that uh, regions fall. Uh, the fling that we have every year, uh, we're supposed to have one this year. Again, this is 2020. Um, maybe in the future, things are back to normal, but at, the, at this stage, having a ball is not the best idea. Is there anything else that kind of jumps out about regions to you or? I really just think it's the community and the community comes together really well because obviously I talk about it a lot um, with reference to like Freshers Week and uh, and the JCR. But in terms of socials, these are really where you see Regents as a community because pretty much everyone, when we have a bop, which is like sort of, sort of like a disco kind of party um, in the JCR and in the bar, everyone comes together, even if they can only come for like half an hour, even if they're wearing a full suit and they've come from something really random they'll come and then someone in a full suit will be standing next to someone who's about to go clubbing and someone else will be in like a pumpkin outfit or something ridiculous 
and uh, and they'll all be sort of dancing to this bop. And at the end of the bop, um, there's like a special song that everyone sings together about Regents, uh, which is really lovely. Um, and even actually in online online Trinity, we've still been running socials. So our socials rep did a few online events, and there would be like twenty people going to them. Which, when you think about the size of Regents, thirty people each year. It's a really good turnout. So in terms of the community, it's, it's very much not something su superficial. Like people genuinely are invested in the community of regions and in supporting each other and going to the socials. And that's what that's where you see the benefits of being such a small college. Hmm. Perfect. No, the, the, um, I didn't manage to make any of the online brews. I say make, obviously, I, I could have gone uh, and chose not to. But yeah, 20 people, it sounds um, really impressive. For my kind of involvement online this term uh one of uh, our jcr secretary uh they ran a competition to win uh biscuits whoever could make the best uh thing out of a toilet roll uh, i'm made a very well i say I, I made i did the body of our college mascot manny the, the tortoise uh, and my friend painted it very nicely i did uh, a slightly uh, demonic looking face on it uh, mm -hmm. and we kind of biscuits but that's kind of just another thing that shows even in kind of very extraordinary circumstances, regions do a really good job of creating some kind of community going throughout this kind of quite restful and possibly quite lonely times as well that people are at home at this stage and creating some kind of shared community. Um, yeah, um, so just to kind of end up, uh, we've spoken quite a lot about the kind of day to day. Um, life of doing history and economics uh i was just wondering first of all with the economics what's the kind of favorite thing you've covered this year and this year's been quite massy i'm guessing what kind of quite theory based um what's jumped out what's the best thing about studying economics the best so thing far? about studying it was that sorry yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, what's the best thing about studying economics at oxford or what's the kind of favorite thing you've covered or Ooh, I mean, I really loved macro microeconomics. Like, as I said, I did a lot of maths, really into my maths, and then microeconomics is a bit more mathematical. Um, what I really enjoyed was, so we get this workbook of maths um, before you join as a fresher. You have to work through a couple of chapters of it, which is actually what you're examined on in North Week if your college decides to. And through that, they work through loads of profit maximization things. And I just really enjoyed them. There's something about working out the cost function of a firm that for some reason I find really satisfying once you get to it, once you get to like your C equals WY or something or whatever it is, it's really satisfying. So I really enjoyed that part of, uh, of microeconomics. And yeah, the tutors are really receptive to what you enjoy and to what you're struggling with which I think is just one of the things that makes Oxford so special and Regent so special because I really enjoyed these. And so my tutor has like pushed us to go a bit further beyond the, the scope of the course. So we've looked at different models of firms. So when you've got two firms competing for control in a market and the different ways they can do that, that's something we've learned like on top of the course because we're interested in it and because we think it's cool and it's fun. And we've been able to do that because we get such close contact, um, which, yeah, has been my favourite part of economics this year. Perfect. And, and what's your favourite thing you've covered in history this year? Ooh, um, it's really hard to say. I'd say probably, so I did a paper on witchcraft this year, uh, which was just the most incredible thing to read about. Uh, so I, my first time I did uh, medieval Europe and then art history, so like statues, propaganda, that kind of thing. And then my second term, I did more medieval history and economic history, which was really interesting. But then in third year, I just, a third year, gosh, third term, I decided to go for witchcraft. And it was just the, the most wild thing. I'd be reading sources about people talking about witches, like with their cauldrons, putting random things in and, and making the, the wildest things happen. And actually studying this paper as a historian knowing only of witchcraft and like in terms of what you know just a regular person knows from watching horrible histories growing up or through popular culture it, it was a really interesting paper and i really enjoyed it because you know history isn't the, the boring subject of wars and nations being built that you think it is there's so much more to it and you go into cultural history 
and sort of the history of ideas in such an interesting way that I didn't anticipate before I came. So yeah, Witchcraft was a great paper. That's probably the highlight of my year this far. Perfect. Yeah, the kind of uh, in the the third term, like you say, you uh, history gets studied the kind of primary sources, and like you say, you do bump into some really, really, really random uh, sources. My, for my own one, uh, we did conquest and colonization of Latin America, and some of the sources you read there uh, say one of my kind of most interesting ones is that because the two sides were so different in the conflicts, there was no kind of uh, no mutual understanding of surrender so uh, some of the kind of Native American um, ways of surrendering the Spanish didn't comprehend and kind of seeing their reaction to it was just kind of one a complete utter kind of confusion um, which is kind of quite interesting like oh my goodness like so many different societies are so different um, perfect uh, so just to kind of end I guess is um, what would you say you've kind of learned most uh, being here at Oxford as in, what would you, what would you say is the kind of one lesson you would give to someone either thinking of applying to Oxford or about to start Oxford? We talked about quite a few of the myths about kind of Freshers' Week that actually it's just one week at Oxford. It's, it doesn't have to be the best week of your life. And we've spoken that, um, you know, you don't have to be some kind of economics graduate to do an economics undergraduate. That you can just be kind of interested in the subject and that will carry you through. Is there any other kind of reflections that you've uh, learned in your kind of year here at Oxford? Uh, yeah, I mean, if I could go back to Freshers Week Holly, I would just like stare her in the face and tell her she's smart enough to be there. And I think mm. this is something that so many people feel. Um, imposter syndrome is a real thing at Oxford. And I think mm. it might be something that people struggle with, particularly if they you know, had their grades assigned to them without being able to do their exams. Because you sort of get here and you're under the impression that everyone else is some kind of child genius fulfilling their prophecy and you know it's very much not the case you know you just got regular people who are quite intelligent and who enjoy their subjects and you are one of them um and especially if you didn't you know if you weren't born thinking you'd study a specific subject like in my case you know i didn't grow up always knowing it would be history and economics i thought it was going to be pp for a bit i thought it was going to be math for a bit i thought it was going to be classics i sort of got here thinking you know am i should I like focus on my work a load because you know I might not be as intelligent as everyone else and maybe I can't afford to go to all the societies because I need to work a bit harder because I'm not I'm not a genius like everyone else and you know it takes some kind of examination I think it took me up to my first collection actually in Hillary terms at the start of second term my collection for my first term uh, of work where I was like okay like I, I belong here I'm fine you know I don't have to they didn't like make a mistake and accidentally let me in. And I know imposter syndrome is something that a lot of people struggle with, some a lot more than others. But you know, for everyone, it's just, it's not the case. You know, if you're struggling, then they'll, they'll tell you, they'll not leave you in the dark. Um, they'll tell you and they'll help you. And if you're not struggling, then you don't have anything to worry about. You know, just enjoy your time here and really don't, don't worry about other people because they're all in the same situation as you. You know, some of them might struggle more than you some less so but you know you're all different people and you all deserve to be there so yeah don't panic too much about being too smart or not smart enough for oxford just you know do your thing and try to enjoy it yeah really really important um message there um yeah thanks very much just um one kind of final thing i guess um you've done just to kind of end on a happy note uh from uh my own knowledge you seem to have done quite, quite a few kind of cool careers Thing. I think you're the JCR careers rep for uh, regions. Can you just speak kind of 30 seconds or so about some of the uh, cool internships you've managed to get uh, the last kind of year at Oxford? Yeah, so when I got to Oxford, I had no clue that, but that careers system is incredible. So I signed up to all the careers emails, and at the end of every term, they'll run loads of micro internships, which are like one week long. And you can just do them for a week. Some of them are remote, some of them are not. And I actually did one of those in Michaelmas. So my very first time at Oxford, in like North week, I had the idea to try and get myself an internship. And I did, and I did a business internship, which was really, really interesting. Really enjoyed, that was in London. Um, and since then I did a spring week at JP Morgan. Um, so I'm hoping to apply to sort of the bigger internships for banking and investment and that kind of thing next year so yeah i've had a lot of uh, good opportunities with the careers they also run lots of events so like people come in and speak 
Um, if you if you've got any of the scholarships, so like the Crank Start Scholarship, they'll have people come in for that as well. They have specific um, internships for that. Yeah, there's loads of programs on, and the university is just constantly sort of giving you more things to apply to, um, which is really amazing actually, um, and I've really enjoyed. Yeah, perfect. Can you just tell, tell me just slightly more about the uh, spring with JP Morgan? What did you kind of find yourself doing uh, most days with that? Yeah, so it was it was right at the start of uh, lockdown actually, so it was remote. Um, yeah, yeah, they did everything remote. So we had we had a call from one of the um, one of the big the big sort of bosses. I'm not really sure. I can't remember mm. off the top of my head what he did. Um, but yeah, we sort of spoke to him about his experiences. We had lots of careers meetings, and then we actually had training from AMT mm. um, AMT training, and they like worked us through finance, how it works. So. Much like with economics, when I came to Oxford, I didn't know anything about economics. And when I started the spring week, I didn't know anything about finance. Um, but yeah, they trained us up, sort of gave us a broad understanding of it, which was really good, um, and which I was definitely supported by my tutor to do. So they're very supportive of your tutors. They want you to do well. They want you to start thinking about your careers and they'll sort of nudge you in directions, think about where your strengths lie. And yeah, he supported me to do that. And then the spring week was all about an introduction to finance and spreadsheets and how they work, which, yeah, I really enjoyed and is hopefully going to help me apply to internships next year. Perfect. Thank you very much. Just sorry, I've said this twice now. Uh, absolute final thing. Uh, favorite thing happened this year? Any kind of funny stories or kind of best memories that you're going to take away? Ooh, that's such a hard one because there are just so many random moments. So I think like I think the, the majority of my best times at Oxford have been like being up at 3 a.m. in the JCR playing ping pong with someone really random that I maybe haven't spoken to all week, you know, and, you know, anyone's down for a game of ping pong at 3 a.m. because, I don't know, they're, they're they're just back from the club or they're just off to the library for some reason, you know, it's just small moments like that. Um, but I definitely say if there's a thing, uh, I went to a ball in Michaelmas, uh, this is an all dates ball, uh, which you were at too. Yeah, it was it was a lovely ball. It was um, we were told about it from our Christian Union rep. So it's an all dates church. Um, I don't go to the church, but yeah, they they did a lovely winter ball, and we all got dressed up, and there was a Christmas tree, and there were lights, and we took a photo of I think there were like thirty or forty people from Regents there, which was <laughs> quite a lot considering the size of Regents. And yeah, it was lovely, which is especially um, especially evident now that the the regent's fling has been cancelled with coronavirus it was really nice to get a winter ball in but yeah there's always balls on at oxford but i'd say yeah it's either that or just the small moments where you catch someone at brew and speak to them for two hours over a biscuit or you play ping pong with someone or you learn about all the five different um kebab shops and kebab vans and you, you pledge allegiance to one of them and then you go there and the chips are like proper kebab chips it's just small things like that which mark oxford because it's just such a special place perfect well uh thanks for take, taking time to speak to me i think in the message uh i asked when i asked you if you